idea here is really an experiment in which every person, or we have 21 people, but every person is only going to taste one wine, right? But we want to organize these observations in such a way that we minimize experimental error. And so what we're doing, and this is sort of an aside because I added a factor in here, which is what if I were to change the labels on the bottles to see if just randomly assigning labels to these things would actually cause people to rate the wine higher. And there was actually a study like this uh, that showed that just better looking labels for the same bottle of wine definitely gets people to actually think it's better. And they did this with uh, amateurs and also wine aficionados, and the same effect was there. Essentially, even the people who really thought they can you know, tell the difference between these things were actually influenced by presentation of the bottle or the wine or uh, the label looking nice. And so anyway, this was just my hypothetical factor to add in here. Um, of course, in my own wine experiments, I wouldn't have manipulations because I don't mess with friends that much. But um, <laughs> if I were to, this is what it would look like. So again, every person out of the 21 are just tasting one wine, right? So we're not repeating within subject at all. Uh, but what we're going to do is only open up one bottle of wine at a time, right? Because if we're going to organize these observations, we want to make sure that wine doesn't go stale. We don't confound anything with oldness of wine. So what we're going to do is run the experiment with seven bottles. We're going to open one bottle at a time. And we're going to have three people uh, try with different labels. So we're basically going to pour that bottle of wine into three bottles that have a cheap uh, looking label, a mid-grade looking label, and an expensive looking label. Um, and so we have to run this experiment, I guess, in this order, right? Because we have to open bottles in order here. Uh, the benefit, though, of not randomizing across all the wines at once, of course, is we would have to run the experiment you know, within some time period before the wine gets stale or whatever. Um, so one thing that's nice about block designs is you're really running the entire experiment within each block over and over and over. So you run basically the whole experiment, these three conditions, seven times, um, but without having to deal with the issue of you know, your wine going bad. Uh, this is also true when you have other things that you're blocking on. Let's say um, maybe time of day or week. You, know, you have to run all your Tuesday experiments at the same time, but you run the whole experiment on that single block or on that single day. So this is actually a great thing about block designs. It's really replicating your experiment within a block over and over and over. OK, so what uh, in this experiment would happen is the person would just taste the wine, give it a rating out of 100. And the question is, of course, uh, does the label make some effect? Right? We probably assume that the quality of wine, these different wines that we have, is also going to have some effect. right? Um, but we don't really care about that insofar as the question of label. right? We just want to remove that variability. OK, so the first thing, let's just take a look at all the, uh, the distributional characteristics to sort of see what we're dealing with. Um, and so first, I'm just going to look at my uh, wine by label cross here. Actually, let me go back. Um, I want to make sure that I have the same numbers of observations. Of course, with randomized complete blocks, we have to have uh, all of our treatments have equal numbers across blocks. So we can't have missing cells here. So we can't be missing you know, the cheap labeled second wine. We actually have to have everything completed. Uh, so we just want to make sure that we have that. So let's go ahead and put just one of our categorical factors as the y, one of them as the x, and just make sure that we have equal numbers in all of our cells. And looking at the mosaic plot, we can see right away that we do. So everything is evenly distributed. So for the cheap, expensive, and mid-grade wines, we have one observation for each of them. And that's perfect. We don't have anything missing here. Um, and again, the issue is if we had, let's say, a missing cell, we were missing for the mid-grade wine, let's say, wine five. Uh, if we didn't have that, we'd have to do a more complicated design. We couldn't just do the randomized complete block analysis that we're going to do next. Um, so really, for these experiments, you have to remember that you always need to have all the conditions accounted for. Since you only have one person per cell, remember, really, what we're talking about here is a situation where we only have one person who did the cheap wine or sorry, the cheap label with wine one. So if you miss that, really the model's going to have a pretty damn hard time to figure out you know, what that mean should have been. So remember, you really have to have complete replications. So this first check is really important. Just make sure you have all the cells you should have. And you do. Uh, the next thing, might as well just check out the distribution of ratings. So without consideration of wine, just looking to make sure we don't have any strange outliers or anything. Let's go ahead and do that. And as far as we're concerned here, things are looking OK. The ratings go from looks to be about 41 to 84, nothing too uh, extreme. None of the wines are getting really high ratings. None of them getting hugely low ratings. That's all fine. 
Uh, the distribution here, as you can see, is not perfectly normal, but uh, I don't think we have to be too concerned about it at this point. Nothing really hugely skewed or really extreme points. Really the biggest problem, as we saw before, is that if you have really extreme points in certain conditions or things like that, that can screw up uh, our analyses. So that's fine. So let's try one thing first. Let's try uh, fitting this model. We're going to do it through fit model. Um, assuming that we didn't actually record which wines we were using. Let's say we were just doing this as a completely randomized design. Right? If we were doing it that way, we would just be putting label in as our model effects right? and looking at the effect on ratings. And so if we do this, and uh, we can minimize some of these things, uh, you can see we really don't have evidence of any effect of labeling. That is, we you know, really, we can look at the, the plot here. We do least squares means plot. And we can see there is at least a numeric difference, but the error is so large here, we can't really detect significantly any differences. We don't have any evidence given this analysis that there's really anything going on with labeling. It doesn't seem to be having an effect. Now we can do the same thing we just did here, but let's imagine we weren't looking at the effect of label, but we were just looking at the effect of wine. Right, so we're looking at these now independently. And if we run this, and if we plot the plot of wine, we can see pretty dramatically that wine does have a pretty huge effect on ratings. That is, you know, certain wines are liked a lot more on average than other wines. People seem to really hate wine four. Uh, people seem to really like wine three. All the rest of them sort of hover around the center. Right, so there's definitely some effect of wine that is blocking on this variable probably makes a lot of sense. Seeing that it has some statistically significant effect is good for us because we blocked on it. Okay, so now let's consider them together. Now the nice thing for us is that doing this, and I'm going to keep this uh, label only analysis open for a second and you'll see why, uh, blocking on wine is as simple as just putting it in as an effect. So we have just wine and label as our effects here. But we're not going to fit the interaction because if you notice, and uh, I'll just do this so you can see, if we were to fit the interaction, the full factorial, we just don't have the degrees of freedom to actually fit a model. That is, if you look at the R square, um, the proportion of variance this accounts for, it's at one. Right? So if we have that interaction in there, essentially we have enough parameters in our model to perfectly fit all the data points. There is no possible way this model could be wrong, essentially. And that's really not good from a statistical standpoint because we can't <coughs> test anything. Right? Our model has enough free parameters to fit the data perfectly. So nothing here is giving us an indication of whether we have error. There is no error from this model because every point essentially is perfectly fit by the model. So we can't do that. Let's close that. Um, so the way we do it here is we just fit the wine and label without the interaction. And so what that's doing, if you remember what our, our model was, going back to this slide, remember our model was just the overall mean, which is the intercept of the model, which is automatically fit, the effect of the blocking variable, and the effect of the treatment variable. That's exactly how we have it set up here. Just the effect of our block and the effect of our treatment. Okay, let's go ahead and run that. And let's compare these outputs. Uh, let me minimize some stuff here. Uh, now first, we might as well check out our effective label. And you see now actually we found a statistically significant difference. That is, we have some evidence that label is actually making some difference for us. Uh, but if we go to, there we go. Um, if we check out the previous report, right, we had no evidence that there was really any effective label, and now we do. So the biggest thing to look at that's going to really account for these differences is if you look at the mean square error for the model that has blocking in there, that has blocked on wine, our mean square error is 10, right? So that's the average error that our model is really having. Uh, if you look at the mean square error when we don't have our blocking variable, it's 152. And think about why this is, right? The mean square errors are pooled within cell error estimate. Right? It's our estimate of what in the population is the pooled within cell error. And the within cells here is just variations around labels. So for things that are labeled as cheap, that's basically the variance around just that label. But when we talk about the mean square here, it's the variance within a wine within a label. And people are a lot closer to the mean within the wine and label than they are just within the label. Think about why. There was that big effect of wine. So if we look at it here, there's just such a big effect of wine that once we remove that effect, then people aren't varying much around their means for each label. That is, if you consider all the people who had cheap wine, we don't have the graph here, I'll show you in a second how to get it, the interaction plot, but all the people who had cheap wines within a single, or sorry, cheap labels within a single wine, there's just not very much variability there. It's explained more by the blocking variable. 
Okay, so now that we've seen that we can actually use the blocking variable, there are some um, things we really want to do to make sure it's appropriate. And the biggest one, of course, is going to be that, uh, well, I guess the first one is that our blocking variable is helping us at all. And by checking to see if it's statistically significantly accounting for variance or if it's actually predicting something, that's a good way to start. You know, the fact that it's uh, statistically significantly predicting or it has some effect of wine is very helpful for us, right? We know that there is evidence out there that it actually accounts for something. Um, so in this case, we wouldn't really have to check much further, right? We're pretty certain that it's going to help us. Uh, if you ran the model without it, which we actually just did, you can see that it really did help us quite a bit. It reduced the mean square quite a bit. Um, but there are other model assumptions that we really have to be careful about, specifically that block by treatment interaction. The fact that we are asserting that the effect of uh, labeling is the same for each wine bottle, right? So that, uh, and actually let's go ahead and look at what the effect of labeling is here. Um, so cheap wine bottles or cheap labels uh, are rated a little bit lower than expensive. And for some weird reason, mid-grade labels are rated much lower. Um, so this labeling effect, right, the fact that expensive labeled bottles get higher ratings, we're asserting that that's going to be the same no matter which bottle of wine we use, right? But we have no way to really plot that or check that uh, given the way we've set up this analysis. Now the easiest way, if we close these things out, is to fit a model that isn't going to give us any helpful statistics, but it'll give us that plot, right? What we really want is this plot of uh, all the wines as separate lines and looking at the effect of the treatment just to see if the treatment is consistent over all those wine bottles. And so the easiest way, and again, you're not doing this to get any statistics, just to get that plot really quickly, uh, is to fit that full factorial. So the analysis that can't give us really any stats. We don't have the degrees of freedom to do anything. But what you get is, at the side here, this wine by label section, and you can request the plot. And what this plot is going to do is give you a visual sort of um, reference for whether there is a block by treatment interaction, right? So uh, a no interaction situation would be that all these lines are perfectly parallel, right? That every uh, treatment profile, so really the profile being higher for expensive and lower for both mid-grade and cheap, um, if this profile was the same for all of our different bottles of wines, we would have really the best evidence for no interaction. But remember, these points are going to vary. This is a single point in our design. Right? So we shouldn't expect that it's going to be perfectly parallel. Uh, we would hope that there's at least a similar relationship or similar profiles across these different bottles of wine. Uh, we're not looking for a perfect profile. And if you see in this case, we have actually pretty good um, evidence of no interaction. That is, for most of these, the profiles are the same. Uh, this wine bottle is especially funky. I don't actually know what happened there. Bottle 7. Right? So for that bottle, for some reason, the mid-grade label was rated much lower. But this is just one person again, remember? So we're wrapping in subject effects here. Um, I would say overall, I would be fairly confident that we can uphold our block by treatment, no interaction sort of assumption. Um, one point to make is that if you do have an interaction, it's not really going to help you at all. It's really going to hurt you. So that interaction, uh, if there is one, is getting dropped into the sums of squares error. So any deviation from a totally parallel model is actually just making it harder for you to find differences. So really the idea of doing this is so that you can make sure that you're not robbing yourself of power. Uh, you're certainly not going to be finding uh, more differences because you have that interaction. So really checking this is to make sure you're not hurting yourself. We're not hurting science by having the interaction because it's just going to make it harder for you to find differences. Um, but think about this point too. If you have a large interaction, right, you should expect it to hurt you because that really is error. It's saying that the treatment is not consistent across all these different blocks. And if what you want to do is assert that labeling has a main effect in the population, that is, it'll affect every person's perception of wine regardless of the bottle, then you know, this effect is really what you're trying to assert. You're trying to say, look, it, there should be no interaction. You think it should be the same across all people. Now, if you really needed to show that there is no interaction, or let's say you wanted to show there is, you'd have to collect more data. Right? We can't run any analysis here because once we fit the parameters for the interaction, we have no remaining error to say if we're fitting better than chance. And again, think of this. Like this point here and all these points are just single individuals. right? So we, can't, we don't have any error around those points to really make a uh, hypothesis test about whether we fit better than chance. 
Uh, but if we had multiple points around here, we'd be able to investigate really the distribution of individuals who had cheap labels on bottle six and bottle five and four, all those different places. And we'd actually be able to test that interaction. And that's no longer really a block design. I mean, it, it has a name. It's called the generalized block design. But it's really just a factorial experiment. We call it a block design because we don't care about the blocking variable explicitly. Uh, but it's just the same thing as a full factorial. And we'll come back to that a little bit later on. All right, so seeing this, I would be fairly confident that we have no real issues going on for our blocking variable. Uh, that interaction, I mean, there are differences here, but this is, again, just one person. So it could be just that person hates wine. Who knows? Uh, but I would be fairly confident that that's OK. Now, the other assumptions that we have are the same as we really have for all of our analysis of variance models. That is, we have to make sure we have equal variances. Uh, but now we have to talk about variances across blocks and also across treatments. So we can do both of these fairly quickly, these uh, plots. If we just do the fit y by x, we can just break down our analysis by wine and label and look at the effect of rating. Now notice we could save the residuals from our model, or we can look at the actual uh, distributions within the normal variable. Um, I said before it's, it's usually nicer to break it down by residuals, because then uh, it's the same for really all models going forward. But notice that you can also do these uh, unequal variances tests just on the regular variables. And that'll produce for you the analyses to tell you if the variances are equal across groups. Uh, we can do the same thing for label. We can do unequal variances tests here. And this is something I haven't seen very often, actually. So Levine's test here uh, came up statistically significant, uh, whereas the rest of these are comfortably non-statistically significant. Uh, I wouldn't think we have much issue there. I'm not actually sure why that happened, though. Uh, Levine's test is just like an f-test for quality of variances, but without the normality assumption. Um, but I don't know. That's interesting that it came up and the others didn't. I'll have to look into that. Anyway, um, so that's one way to get a quick just guess at the variances for these groups. Uh, let's do it the, the actually correct way. So let's go back into our model um, and actually save the residuals. So once you fit it without the interaction, we can go in and just save columns and save our residuals. Let's close all of these. And we can do the same thing, fit y by x, put wine and label in here as our factor, and look at the residuals. Now, I could break this down by uh, the combination of wine and uh, labeling. Like we done before, we looked at the really the distribution within treatment cells, not within uh, factors. But notice that if I were to you know, do that concatenate function and actually come up with combinations of treatments, I would have one person in each of those combinations, which would make it very hard to do any distributional analysis or homogeneity of variance tests. Um, so I just want to point out that we get all the same results here. Or not. That's super bizarre. <laughs> um, those are not the same, and they really, really ought to be. Well, Wikipedia says that Levine uses uh -huh. the mean, whereas all the rest of these are median. These are more robust. Yeah, O'Brien's is a uh, median, so is Brown Forsyth. I'm more concerned now that the numbers are different. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Well, I'll get back to you on that one. Um, oh, oh, these are probably residualized around, yeah, with the blocking taken out. Oh, yeah, this is like covariance models, too. Yeah, without the interaction, we have to do it this way. Sorry, back up. Do not look at the distributions within or the fit web x of just the raw variable. So just like covariance models, we're residualizing. We're taking out the effect of that block without the individual cell. Um, so we're just taking the main effect of the block out. Right. Sorry, that was probably very confusing. So like I said before, the best way, as always, is using your residuals. That's really the assumption of the model is about the residuals. So although in regular analysis of variances, you can just use the raw rating. That is, you can use the raw variable broken up into groups for covariance models and also for models like block designs. Just make sure you always save the residuals here. So under save columns, do the residuals. And again, it's just a good habit, like I said before, to get into for all of these, just because uh, really the model's making the predictions about the residuals or assumptions about the residuals and not the actual raw variables. Um, so here's actually something I could do to make that point maybe more clear. Um, and also demo another way you can do these analyses, which is using fit y by x. 
there actually is a specific section for blocking variables, and you can see how it uh, residualizes around the block. So if we take wine here, which is our block, right, and put it in the section appropriately named, uh, take label and put it as our factor, and again, we're trying to get at ratings here. Uh, the analysis here, you can say rating, which is block-centered now. So this is our block-centered ratings. And when you do the analysis here, as a, a means or ANOVA, it's going to give us the same analysis, so 0.136 for our effective label, showing that our blocking variable is statistically significant. Um, but what it's done here is that this is essentially the uh, grand mean with the treatment effects added uh, regardless of which wine they were. So basically, if they're in the cheap group, they're getting you know so much mean added to them, so much treatment effect added. Expensive, a little bit higher, and mid-grade lower. Um, so yeah, these residuals are what it's really showing us, the residuals around the grand mean without the effect of block in there, so with all the block effects removed. And again, if you have actually just one variable and a blocking variable, this is a nice way to run it. It's quick. Um, it gives you all the same information, but you know, if you like fit y by x, you can do it this way rather quickly. Okay. So that was my example. Let's go back over here. So appropriateness of the randomized complete block. Again, the error variability by blocks, we want to make sure that you know, certain blocks aren't more variable. It would be bad for us if certain wines had a lot more variance, right, than other wines, which actually might be the case. Like certain wines have more of a, I don't know, a choir taste, so maybe you would stretch out individuals in that case. Some people would really like it, some people would hate it. Uh, whereas, you know, everybody has the same reaction to Two Buck Chuck. You know, it's sort of, okay, fine, I'm drinking this, but yeah. That's <laughs> probably not very variable. There aren't many people who are like super wowed by it and others who hate it. It's probably right in the middle. Um, certainly error variability by treatments, we want to make sure that, you know, individuals aren't more variable when they're, you know, seeing a bottle of certain labels than others, uh, and that block by treatment interaction. Now this time effect, I put this in here because the book makes a point about this, a lot of block designs use time of day or day of week as blocking variables, so you actually get the ability to now test for whether there is actually some time effect, and that's whether the blocks are increasing in some specific fashion or not. Um, and so using contrast that we've seen before, you can actually run analyses to see if, you know, uh, your error is getting larger or if things are happening across time. And that's as simple as just running these things and looking, really plotting them across time to see if there's some increase in variance effect. Um, you could also see if, you know, uh, your measurement device is getting worse and worse, things like this. I mean, uh, time effects are, are bad, of course. Usually we randomize out the effect of time, because in most of our experiments we're randomizing treatment orders anyway, and we randomly assign across, let's say, a quarter. Um, but there certainly are time effects in everything we do. You know, your one and nines get better, hopefully, at running your experiment. Uh, they could also get lazier. You never know. Those two things may counter, you know, it's, or I don't know. Um, but at the same point, you know, you want to check for these things if you can. So if you have data collected in some order, it's worthwhile just to check that order, plot it against the time variable and just see. Okay, uh, that was the other one. Let's go back down here. Okay, so the next one I wanted to talk about was when you have factorial treatments. And this is uh, essentially just like a regular factorial ANOVA if you look at this model. Uh, let's ignore the row variable here and just say, you know, you have your alpha J, your effect of being in your row treatment, uh, the beta K is the effect of being in the column, you have your interaction terms, and then you have error. But notice that this model has included in this, this now blocking variable, this row factor. Uh, but you don't have any interactions with row here. That is, there's not the alpha by row interaction, the beta by row, or the alpha beta by row. You just have your main effect, essentially. And it really, really, in this case, it is a main effect. It's the main effect of being in some block that we're trying to remove. So in this wine example, again, we can do a factorial experiment where we have one person for each treatment within a block, then we repeat that experiment over blocks. So if you open the next data set, let's close this one, and you open that RCB2 factor, you see we've added uh, one new factor to the experiment and added some cells so we have enough degrees of freedom. Uh, what I've sort of done in this one is to say, well, not only are we going to label the bottles differently, we're also going to have either a magnum, the large bottle, that big ass, really 
classy looking one, um, or just the regular small bottle, the 750s that they have of wine. Um, and so the question is, you know, is there not only some effect of label, is there some effect of having it in the large party bottle or the small on people's perception of wine quality? Uh, and is there some interaction, right? Maybe it's the case that these labels have a different effect when it's in a small bottle versus a large <coughs> bottle. And if you think about this, this might be true. You know, an expensive labeled small bottle, you might think it's much better than an expensive labeled large bottle because you're like, oh, it's small. You know, it's presumably it's going to be more expensive for the same quantity of, of alcohol. So uh, maybe it's a better wine or a better, you know, product. Um, people make all sorts of interesting attributions when you do product design and things. Uh, so this may be an experiment you want to do. But notice that we don't have to uh, replicate within a wine. So we have for wine one here and wine one down here, uh, no replications of a single treatment. So we have the cheap, mid-grade, and expensive labels on large bottles, and the cheap, mid-grade, expensive on small bottles. But we don't need to replicate that within our experiment. We just have one person per cell again within the treatments. OK, so the first thing, again, I would do here is make sure that we have all of our cells. I mean, you could, since they're sorted the way they are, you can see pretty easily right now. Uh, but a real quick way, if you have this many categorical variables, I can show you to uh, get at this, is just take all of them and then put them into both sections. And so what this is going to do is plot the mosaic plots of every factor against every other factor. And so if we run this, what I'm going to do is just get rid of some of the clutter. I'm going to hold down Command or Control if you're on a PC and just uncheck the contingency table and the tests. So all I did was hold down command and uncheck those both. And I'm also going to hold down command and drag these in just a little bit so I can get them all on the same screen. And again, by holding down command, it's propagating that for us. Uh, and what this does for us, if you look on the diagonal, it's a variable plotted against itself. So it's just the single distribution of that variable. And then all the off diagonals are showing us the combinations. So this is wine by label plotted. And you see that we have equal distributions of wines and labels. Uh, this is wines and bottles, equal numbers of wines in each bottle type. And we can see down here, the last one, the wine by label type. Uh, you can see we have equal numbers of wines by each label. And equal numbers of wines by small, which I guess we saw up here too. Um, so the benefit of doing it this way is you just real quick can see across the board, every factor is crossed with every other factor perfectly. And we, uh, we have, just as we thought, just one person in each cell, which is perfect for us. And this is helpful, too, if you have any other categorical variables or if you want to plot anything against anything else, just throw them into the top and bottom sections of that fit y by x, and you'll get all the combination plots. Um, of course, it gets large very quickly, but um, you can just take things out if you need to. OK, so having done that, Let's look at how we'd fit this model. So we can't do it through fit y by x, right? Because we can't block and put in multiple factors. Uh, we can block and do one factor, but we can't put in multiple factors. It'll just run the analysis separately. We do that. So we have to do it through fit model. And if we go back to our specification here, we can see exactly what we need to put in. We have to have some effect of our blocking variable. So let's do that one. So just take wine and add that. And then notice the rest of this is just the standard full factorial. It's the factorial combination of the row effect, the column effect, and then the interaction. And so to get those in there, we could actually just take label and bottle size and then have the macro for us make that full factorial. Right? And if we compare these, now we have wine, that's our blocking variable, row, label, alpha, bottle size, beta, and label by bottle size, the alpha, beta interaction terms. All right, so you see there's a real direct specification correspondence here between really what model we're trying to make and how we put it into JMP. Uh, and I bring that up because <laughs> as we move forward, you can just keep doing that for any more complex model. Just line it up in JMP with the model specifications. Um, so once we start getting into random effects, it's going to be as simple as taking uh, whatever factor is random and then just marking it as a random effect. So in the book, when it actually puts these out, this will just be a covariance or a variance, not a fixed effect. And you'll see that you can just put into JMP just like it is in the book. Very easy. Uh, now, I'll make the point too. When we get to repeated measures experiments, we're going to treat subjects like blocks, right? So if this was a subject variable, instead of having you know uh, all these different bottles of wine, we actually had seven subjects who went through and did all these combinations, hopefully on different days or in counterbalanced orders, because uh, as they drink more and more bottles, of course, they're going to get hammered. But uh, 
if we had subjects, not wine bottles, we would just have subjects as a random factor. And the only thing we'd have to change in the specification is marking it as a random effect. So we would just mark that. Um, and what JMP will do is the linear mixed model with reduced maximum likelihood estimation of our parameters. Um, really a nice analytic structure or analytic method for repeated measures and just super simple in JMP to specify. Um, we're not going to do that. I'm just going to uncheck that. But notice that that's all you'd have to do if this were a repeated measures experiment. And instead of having wine as blocking variables, it was a person. So very simple. You can think about that would be a nice sub or a nice study to run uh, as far as utilizing subjects. It'd be a lot cheaper than running, you know, however many people, 42. You'd only have to run seven. So, okay. And subjects would like that too because they would drink a lot of wine. Anyway, so once we have this set up, again, we check to make sure we have all the right specifications. We do. Let's go ahead and run the model. And uh, I'm going to minimize this parameter estimate section since we're not going to be using that. And we can look at, again, to make sure that our blocking variable is actually having some effect. It's helping us in some way. Uh, we see that wine does. It's statistically significant. Uh, even if it wasn't statistically significant, it still could be helping us in the analysis. You could always just drop it from the model and see if it changes your analysis. Um, but right here, we definitely know it is accounting for some variability. Uh, label here, again, is making an effect, right? There's an effect of labeling. Uh, bottle size doesn't seem to have an overall effect, but at the highest level, we do have a label by bottle size interaction, right? Something interactive is happening here. The effect of labeling is not the same for small and large bottles. Um, and to really get at what that effect is, we can just go to that interaction section and request that plot. And what we can see if we uh, make this a little bigger and zoom in. So we can see that for large bottles, uh, the labeling doesn't seem to be having much of an effect. Right? The labeling's not changing much for those, those bottles. But for small bottles, the little one, labeling actually does have a pretty big effect, where the expensive bottle is definitely getting the highest ratings, mid-grade right in the middle, and cheapest the lowest. Now you can also think about this interaction from a different standpoint, that for mid-grade bottles, the bottle size isn't changing anything about whether they're liking it or not. Right? They're really indifferent. But when it's an expensive bottle, right? Going to a small bottle is going to increase their rating of it. Um, and if you have a cheap bottle, small bottles actually get lower ratings. So people like the, the big handles of cheap labeled bottles. Um, now, this is just numerically. We'd want to check these. The nice thing about uh, JMP with these types of models, there's nothing different. We can just request the two keys here. And we could actually see if these comparisons are all uh, panning out. And that's a lot of crap, so let's minimize the, or I'm just going to take off the um, cross tabs here. So uh, within the smalls, so we can see that, um, that ex well, let's actually look to see what important comparisons. I think it would be interesting if moving from a large bottle to a small bottle for expensive would actually increase their ratings. So that would be within expensive. Let's see if there's a difference between small and large. Oh, uh, that's too bad, and there's not. Um, so it's numerically different, but it's not enough to be, uh, I guess, statistically significant. Uh, cheap, let's see if cheap, large, and small are different. Um, nope, they're not different either. <laughs> so really, this interaction is probably going to be driven by the fact that probably small, cheap, and expensive, small, yeah, small, cheap, and expensive, small are different here, but probably not here. So under smalls, so small, cheap, and expensive, yeah, so those are differing, yep. But what about large, small? <laughs> large, small? No, large, <laughs> expensive, and large, cheap. I'm getting these labels all screwed up. Uh, so large, cheap, and what was I saying? <laughs> expensive, <laughs> expensive, large. Uh, and they're not differing, yeah, so a lot of the interaction is probably driven by that. Um, so the way you'd probably want to say this is that really for larger bottles, they're not differentiated much by labels, but for small bottles, the differentiation becomes more important. Um, right, and this is actually, you know, a decent effect to find by just running one subject in each of these cells. Not too, not too many people, not too uh, large power, honestly. Um, but I made these effects pretty, pretty striking, actually. Um, anyway. So given that everything else is the same here, there's not too much more I have to talk about in here. Uh, but one thing we'd want to do, of course, is check that block by treatment interaction effect. We want to make sure that block by really our factorial treatment is not any different. 
And so this gets into this issue of we have to concatenate some things to actually get this plot. Um, so if we close this, and again, what we're trying to get here is a plot like we had before, which was um, all the wines as separate lines, and then all of our treatments all on the x-axis so that we can just see if they're parallel. Right? We want to see if the effect is really consistent across all of our blocks. And uh, the point I want to make, though, is if you were to fit the model, like I said before, with all the factors, this is what we did before, is we ran that full factorial, and then we went all the way over and actually requested, wow, it's a lot of, a lot of crap there, um, the wine by label by bottle size. So that plot, <laughs> which you remember with two factors, it was nice and it gave us those separate lines, now it's just uninterpretable and useless. So I don't know if any of you can get the block by treatment interaction effect here, but, um, and who knows what, you know, order they've even plotted these. What, Kevin? You can see it? Yeah. It's totally there. Anyway. So, obviously. Um, so we're not going to do that. That's, uh, that's probably the more complicated way than of doing it. What we can do, though, is stretch our design into a one-way. And this is something that's totally fine with factorial experiments. You could even do that and make your interaction contrast and everything on your, on your own if you wanted to. But we're going to do the first step in stretching a factorial to one-way design, which is just concatenating our variables. Uh, so if you remember, we need to make a new variable. I'm going to call it treatment and give it a formula. And what we're going to do, and we already have character columns here, so our labels and bottle size are characters, so we can use the character function of concatenating. So we just go under character, concat, uh, and again we just have to give it the two columns that correspond to these treatments. So we're going to do labels and bottle size. And uh, just to make the point here, if you double click on um, this outer line, so I don't know if you can see the outer line, there's the outer line and then the inner ones. Double click on the outer line, you can see what it uses in uh, the scripting language to do this. It's just colon, the first column, double pipe, colon, the next column. Uh, and if you want to, you can, you can get fancy here, so we can double pipe it, put a thing, a thing, a quote, uh, put a space, and then put another double pipe. And what this will do for us is our concatenated variable won't have, you know, total squishing. It'll actually put a space in there for us, so you can get fancy. Um, you can make this and, you know, you can do whatever you want. Uh, none of that's necessary, just a point to make. Uh, so in case you ever have to do something like that. Okay, so now we have our treatments, right? So these are all the combinations of our bottle size and label. Uh, and what we're going to do is go back into fit model. And we're going to fit that over-specified model, the one that has uh, enough parameters to perfectly fit the data. So we're going to take treatment now and wine and fit a full factorial. So again, what we're trying to do is get that block by treatment plot. Uh, so we're just going to fit the full factorial of that. And we're trying to predict rating. So if we run this, again, the model's going to fit perfectly because we have enough parameters to do that. But <coughs> down here under wine by treatment, we can get the plot looking at whether we have really consistency across these blocks. And so if we zoom in here a little bit, you can see for each wine, uh, we get a plot of you know, cheap and large, cheap and small, expensive and large, expensive and small, mid-grade and large and small. Um, and this is just getting kind of awkward and messy, but uh, nothing looks horribly wrong. I mean, the patterns are certainly, the profiles are different. Um, most of them are going down within the first step here, and then they sort of all go back up and back down. Um, I mean, again, in this case, this is sort of one of these things that's judgment call, because, um, you know, these are all single points, so we're really plotting these things and hoping that we don't have bizarre subjects giving us strange ratings. Uh, but I would be fairly comfortable with this. If you sort of look at the overall trend, it's not crazy-like, right? It's sort of blocks are certainly separated, so the wines are certainly making a difference. But everything sort of goes up and back down in a way, except for these uh, bottles here, a little bit strange going down. But I wouldn't be concerned by this. Um, and again, if we really wanted to see if uh, you know, we're overly influencing our air term, you know, above and beyond the effect of wine, we could take wine out of the analysis and actually see, so if we go back here, and just imagine we're just treating this as a randomized design, we're going to fit label and bottle size, we can see if that actually, you know, shows a better effect. And actually, if we do that, 
without y as our blocking variable, see we just lose um, our effects altogether. Basically, without that y soaking up all the air variability for the block effects, um, we really aren't able to show statistically that there's any effective labels or bottle size, and certainly not an interaction. So in this case, uh, our assumptions of that interaction being too big between the blocks and wine, I don't think we have to worry about it. Um, certainly, we can show that we have uh, helped our analysis by adding in this blocking variable. Now I'll make a point, uh, before Kevin makes a point, which is that uh, we really shouldn't capitalize hugely on chance when we do experiments. Don't have a bunch of things that you might block on and then just add them in or not based on whether it helps you. Uh, it's a different situation than if you, let's say, start an experiment knowing you're going to block on something. Uh, you run the experiment, find out the block doesn't really have much of an effect, and remove it. So it's a different situation than you have a bunch of things you could use in your analysis, and you just start putting them in or taking them out to see what will help your analysis. So notice how those are subtly different. In one case, you're sort of setting your experiment up to block on something, and you find out you know, lo and behold to you that it's not a very good blocking variable because it doesn't soak up any variance. And if you remove it then, you haven't capitalized the same way as if you have, let's say, five variables you might add in as blocks, and you measure them, and then just do the analysis over and over until you get one that helps. So I wouldn't do the latter. Uh, if you know you're going to want to block on something like wine, I mean, set up your experiment so you do it that way. And of course, you should be randomizing within your blocks anyway, so the way you do your experiment will be a little different if you know you're going to be using a blocking variable. Um, but certainly, you don't want to just be, and this goes for most analyses, especially when you have lots of factors or lots of variables you could use. It's not a very good idea to just try to run everything to see which things support your hypotheses. I mean, with all analyses, try to be as focused as you possibly can and specify things as much as possible in advance. Um, because again, if you just have the opportunity to run 50 different types of analyses with different combinations of factors, uh, by chance alone, some of those are going to support your hypotheses. And if those are the only ones you end up reporting, uh, it oversells your point probably a little bit. Not that I think any of you are going to try to be dishonest about statistics. It's just very easy to, you know, if you have 10 factors, pick and choose which ones you want to put in there. You know, just try to be predictive about these things. You think something should happen, test the hypothesis. If it doesn't turn out, you know, accept that it's at least a possibility that you're wrong. You know, don't keep trying to make it work. Um, not to say you shouldn't, you know, be persistent, just not too much. Okay. Any questions on, on those or anything I've done so far? Yeah. Something slightly off topic, but okay. tangentially related. Um, so in all of these blocking uh, experiments, we've always talked about uh, blocking such that the size within each of the blocks is one. Is yeah, yeah is one, mm -hmm. or occasionally less than one in that dangerous mark we just read. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Is it? I mean, in this case, for mm -hmm. instance, you know, you're probably not going to pour a full bottle of large, expensive mm -hmm. wine and then just pour one glass out of it mm -hmm. and then replace it with something else. Right. Um, you could use that to say sure. three. Yeah, we could get like seven subjects. Yeah, yeah. So is it okay to have blocks of more than one? Sure. And that's actually, so uh, I don't have much to talk about on it, but it's just called this generalized randomized block model. Um, and if you notice what this is, this is your, this is the one factor. So imagine we just had wine and label. Uh, but notice that there's now this block by treatment interaction. This is just an analysis of variance with okay. factorial design. Um, it's funny though because it's this thing where if you really know you're not going to say anything about block, like you really just don't care about the block, the randomized cow design thing, uh, then you can call it a generalized randomized block model and I guess impress some people or something. But it's just a factorial experiment, right? You're not doing anything special. There's nothing different about the model specification, how you run it, how you analyze it, uh, how you interpret it. It's all the same. Uh, it just gets this extra name because I guess it comes from this idea of, well, if you have replicates within a, within a treatment, essentially, um, you're able to now estimate that interaction term. Now, it's not always the case that you need to fit that interaction. You do lose degrees of freedom by fitting an interaction, fitting all those uh, parameters, if you don't need it at all. So if you, know, you have great justification for how there could be no possible interaction between blocks, uh, let's say your blocks are just machines that have different efficiency, and you have, like you know, you know or how about this? We're testing whether people are better at copying 
large stacks of paper or small stacks, and we have them upstairs in our copiers, and we know one of them is just slower, like the one on the right sucks, you know, and the one on the left is good. Um, we don't think there's going to be any interaction between those two because it's just we know there's just a mean difference in their speed. And that's all we want to you know take care of is the mean difference. So we don't have to fit that interaction because we can almost say based on a physical explanation of how there couldn't be an interaction, right? And for social psychological things or psychological things, it's harder to justify on a physical basis. But a lot of times, you know, you'll have really consistent effects, and you can have all these replications and not fit that interaction, um, and not use up those degrees of freedom. But anyway, to answer your question, yeah, if you have replicates, which you should, I mean, there's no reason not to for most of our experiments, uh, running one person into each treatment, um, I mean, it's just, it's, the savings aren't huge, and you don't get the ability to estimate that interaction, so honestly, it makes a lot more sense to spend the extra time. Uh, I mean, the reason for all these things is to increase precision in the face of really expensive subject running costs. So if we can only run 40 subjects. We want to organize them in such a way where we get the most use out of them, right? Or we get the least variability around whatever true effect there is. So we'll see with um, things like analysis of covariance models, we're going to do the same thing but with quantitative predictors. So instead of using a qualitative grouping variable, you know, uh, type of wine, we can use something quantitative and, you know, increase the precision of our estimates by getting rid of error variability. But, I mean, but again, like if you can run tons of subjects, most of these procedures just are not necessary because if you can run a ton of subjects, you're going to get really precise estimates without having to make assumptions like there are no interactions because you're going to have enough people to test them. Uh, and if they are there, great. If not, great too. You know. So anyway, yes, yeah, generalized randomized block model is the name of the one where you have replications. Uh, now make the point two. We're not going to do anything with them tonight, but uh, these reduced Latin square designs. So instead of having a complete randomized block model, you just have some observations from different combinations of cells. Uh, you set them up in JMP identically. Uh, you just fit them without those interactions, and it'll fit the model just fine. Um, and as long as you've organized your observations or organized your treatments in such a way that you're not confounding with interactions, like you. In these Latin square designs, you can't estimate certain interactions, but they're not confounded with them. So you have observations from, let's say, cheap and small, but you wouldn't have mid-grade and small. You'd have mid-grade and large or something. Um, and so the, the benefit of the Latin square designs is you get to run a subset of all the possible conditions without confounding higher order interactions. But uh, you're also in this case of, well, you can't estimate them either. So if they are there, um, they're just going to fall into your error term but you don't want them to fall into a treatment term. It's really the important thing about Latin square designs. If the interactions are there, it's just going to hurt you. It's not going to magnify some effect, um, which is you know, the idea of a confound. It's not going to soak into the treatment effects. And uh, we'll talk about this probably not next time. We'll do non-orthogonal, but maybe the time after, this design of experiment section. And uh, I mean, I even, I even recommend going to the help and looking at the book for this, the design of experiment guide, because uh, this is a super, super handy tool uh, which lets you essentially add in what factors you have in your experiment. Let's say we have a three-level three level factor there, three-level factor here. And we have our Y response, which we're trying to like maximize to, I don't know, lower limit, 80, upper limit 100. Um, your goal is to maximize that. And you know this factor, X2, is very hard to manipulate. Maybe it's something that you just, if you set it, like, I don't know, what's a eye tracking things, right? You probably have things where it just takes a while to set up something and so you wouldn't want to change that factor. I don't know, maybe heat for a room if you're trying to look at the effect of that. You wouldn't want to have one subject run in a hot room and then have to cool it down to make it cold for the next subject. You want to organize your running so that it, it's simplest for you. Uh, things like soil consistency or soil density uh, if you're doing this agriculture. Anyway, so you can tell JMP uh, sort of what you're trying to do, what you're trying to estimate. You can say you want to be able to estimate second order interactions. Um, and let's say you also want to estimate possibly uh, quadratic effects. Let's do second order power. No, it's not letting me do it. Well, we'll just do that for now. Anyway, um, and let's say you want to s group them into plots of four, I don't know, something weird. And what it can do for you is actually come up with the optimal way of running the experiment in terms of order and also in terms of not confounding conditions. Uh, and you can have it, you know, um, you can look at prediction variance profiles and have it come up with um, 
like what effects you're going to be estimating optimally. And it can do lots of really, um, really interesting things with this. And then it'll make you your data table, which you can just then run in that order and then uh, put in the data. And it even sets up your model for you on the side. So if you have it, it'll actually know you're doing a randomized block with the interaction. It'll do the estimation for you and run it. So uh, design of experiments is super cool, that setting. Um, Why have you started to <laughs> um, I mean, it, yeah, we, you, you, yeah, <laughs> maybe. Um, it, it's worth checking out. And it's, I mean, something I'll admit, I, I have only played with this a little bit. Um, I had some really, really annoying Latin square designs I had to randomize for, and so I used it. But most of the time, you just don't, most of the time we're doing full factorial experiments where we just randomize the order, so these things aren't really important. And we're not usually doing designs where we have to maximize uh, certain things. We're not trying to, I don't know, the example they have, which is really funny um, in their books here, the example they take you through is, let's say you want to run an experiment looking at how well you can pop popcorn. And its example takes you through setting up the situation. What you're trying to do is manipulate how long you cook it, what power you cook it at, and which brand you use. And you're trying to maximize the kernels popped. And it'll actually make this design for you. And you can say, look, your factor space. You don't want any designs where you have uh, three minutes at less than seven power or five minutes any more than eight power because you know it'll just burn them. So you can set up your factor conditions and what constraints and it'll actually, and you say you want to estimate quadratic terms that is necessary to estimate uh, and it'll make this whole design for you in what powers to run it at and what time to run. <laughs> it actually says too, to round, it says this is the optimal design for actually estimating quadratic relationships. But uh, if you didn't have a microwave that could set at 8.994, you know, just round up. Um, but yeah, its point is, you know, once you do this and you fill it in, uh, you know, it has all the scripts to actually estimate it, and it'll show you the uh, prediction traces and all these things too. So it's actually really advanced with these design of experiment things. Um, so I would recommend just going through the design of experiment guide and doing the introductory one. Uh, so it's again, it's under help, books, this DOE. Um, yeah, I just haven't played with it too much, so I can't uh, point out things right now, but I'll check it out a little more for you guys, because uh, it is pretty neat. Um, so in any case, these Latin square designs are, are fairly simple to run. Um, you run them at the cost of not being able to estimate a lot of interactions and making a lot of assumptions about where there are and are not interactions, uh, but you get the benefit of running much fewer subjects. So uh, again, for us, subject costs are often cheap. Um, if we're not running, you know, physio experiments or things with fMRIs or uh, of that sort, but you know, if you have to, these Latin square designs are, are nice, but they're easy to, you know, analyze too. You just put them in, and JMP will estimate everything just fine. Okay, so that's all I have for tonight. Is there any questions about anything I've covered? No, I guess I'm all good. Get to uh, Cozumel's. See you guys.